Okay, so the United States has a history of deportation. In this particular case, it was native peoples and they deported them or they had an out-migration from their particular lands. And this has been the history with regards to native peoples. And again, how does a society come to hate? Well, Thomas Jefferson set it in motion when you take a look at this Declaration of Independence it says, merciless Indian savages. Uh, please understand that. So when we talk about racism, especially with regards to Trump and immigration policy, let's just know that the United States has its history uh, with regards to native peoples. So when the United States is going to take over Mexico and take over half of its territory and take it away from Mexico, and they're going to call it California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, along with Colorado, the native peoples likewise are going to encounter a policy of removal. So the Navajo and the Apache are going to be formidable groups who resisted both Mexico and the United States economic expansion. So let's appreciate what happened to, Navajo, to the Navajo. The Navajo likewise have an experience with genocide. Their experience with genocide is known as Bosque Redondo. In Bosque Redondo, the Navajo have a long history of interaction, intermingling, miscegenation, and raiding with Spanish, Mexican, Apache, Comanche, Ute, Pueblo, and eventually Anglo-American people. And their traditional homeland, Dineta, covers an area that encompasses northeastern Arizona and western New Mexico. So if we could put uh, Bosque Redondo um, in the 1864 Navajo Long Walk. Because right after the U.S. war with Mexico, conflicts escalated between Navajos and Americans coming into their lands. And after a series of failed treaties with the U.S. government, resistance groups under the leadership of Manuelito and Barbosinto in the 1860s demanded reparations for the loss of sacred lands, the right to a subsistence existence, and the return of grazing lands to reserve their economic livelihood based on sheep grazing. So after some confusion over a dispute, over uh, about the winner of a horse race, a shot rang out and murder and death ensued. And with the Civil War in progress at the time of the conflict, the Union Army had to concern itself with the Confederates instead of the Navajo question. Orders were eventually given to Kit Carson to effect a Navajo surrender on July 20th, 1863. And when the Navajo refused to surrender, Carson ordered a scorched earth campaign to starve the Navajo into submission. And despite the resistance efforts of Manuelito, thousands of Navajos surrendered. Carson immediately initiated what the Navajo referred to in their history as the Long Walk. And in January of 1864, between 8,000 to 9,000 people were sent to concentration camps. And over 200 are going to die on a 300-mile stretch that took 18 days to travel by foot. And basically, it was elders and children who could not keep up with the march, and they were just shot right on site. And the people were to be relocated to Fort Sumner in an area called Bosque Redondo, which in Spanish means a round grove of trees in the Pecos River Valley, which is in Texas. There the Navajo will meet their traditional enemy who were facing the same federal removal policy, the Mescalero Apache. Despite the government's attempt to create the first Indian reservation west of Indian territory, the Mescalero and Navajo faced starvation, disease, and death. And by 1868, the United States realized that it was committing genocide. And so they created a treaty that was allowed for the relocation of Navajo and Mescalero back to their current reservations. But the, and, and let me just share with you that every state has its history of native removal. Every state has its history of genocide. And California is no exception. Because in California, they literally called it Indian hunting season, where you can go out and just kill a Native American to get their lands. And so uh, the most atrocious of all experiences is what is known as the Sand Creek Massacre of November 29, 1864. This is the ultimate act of genocide that was committed by a 700-man force of the Colorado Territory Militia. It was under the leadership of this particular man, Colonel John Milton Chivington. He was a Methodist preacher and an anti-slavery advocate but he sent 800 troops of the 1st and 3rd Colorado Company and uh, volunteers from the 1st New Mexico Company. And it, he sent them into a northern Cheyenne camp under the leadership of Black Kettle. An American flag and a white flag of peace flew over Black Kettle's lodge. But Shivington was anxious for a fight. And what happened, all of his soldiers got drunk 
and they went in and they committed genocide. Shivington bragged that he killed 500 to 600 warriors, but the Cheyenne counted 53 men and 110 women and children dead. In fact, 15 Colorado militiamen were killed and 50 were wounded, not from native retaliation because they didn't have any arms, but from friendly fire caused by drunken behavior. The militia plundered the camp and left no one alive. They dressed their weapons, hats, and military regalia with body parts. Fetuses were ripped out of pregnant women, and male and female genitalia were used to cover their saddles. Women's clitorises were wrapped around saddle horns. Pubic hair garnished holsters and belts. And they traveled to Denver, and they displayed their battle trophies to the population. A congressional committee investigating the massacre condemned the atrocities, but no one was punished. The U.S. convention conveniently washed its hands of the atrocity. So after the Civil War, the United States went on a protracted program of annihilation of Native peoples west of the Mississippi. Today, we appreciate the wars Hollywood gives us as wagon trains made their way west to tame, quote-unquote, the wilderness filled with savages. John Wayne, Kevin Costner, and yes, equal opportunity to blacks, Will Smith, have popularized the Wild West in the American imagination. This is civility versus savagery. The wilderness needs to be tamed by courageous people. Today, the US military, the CIA, and the National Security Council still uses the concepts of taming the wilds in their descriptions of policies against enemies. We haven't ended it. We have Tomahawk missiles, Apache helicopters, Comanche drones, and of course in Obama's administration with the capture of Osama bin Laden, it was called Operation Geronimo. So let's go to one of the ultimate acts that's known, and that was the ghost dance. And the ultimate act was Wounded Knee. Let's go to a film clip, understand the ghost dance as a religious movement that was incorporated into numerous American belief systems, Native American belief systems. The ghost dance was first practiced among the Nevada Paiute, and the practice spread throughout much of the western United States, and it quickly reached areas of California and Oklahoma. And as the ghost dance spread from its original source, Native American nations synthesized selective aspects of the ritual with their own beliefs. And this process created change in both society that integrated it and the ritual itself. The chief figure in the movement was this prophet of peace, Jack Wilson, known as Wavoka. Now, different native cultures incorporated this dance, and native peoples never called it the ghost dance. It is white people who called it the ghost dance because they were spooked by the fact that native peoples were their spirit world was adjusting to the transformations. Let's go to a documentary that helps us appreciate the dance. 